Great, okay. Thank you very much to Anthony. So that was a very thorough introduction. I won't delay proceedings too much longer. I will say that the book that I read to prepare for this, which some of you might have seen in the advertisement, is this one. It's come out from uh, Oxford University Press, Debating Democracy, Do We Need More or Less, which I can't recommend highly enough. Um, I found it absolutely fascinating, very engaging. Uh, one thing I like is that neither of the authors are defending the status quo. So this isn't a book that's about kind of whether or not we should have what we have now. It's, uh, you know, both, uh, both of you are presenting um, ways that we might reform or improve the situation that we're in. It's just whether we want to do that by going in a more democratic direction or a less democratic direction, roughly speaking. Um, so I thought what I might ask you to do to begin with is just to outline uh, your position uh, very briefly, as you stated in the book. Um, and then I think it would be it would be nice if if you could have the chance to ask each other questions uh, in a live format, which you know in this book you kind of just mostly just each present your case and then have one chance to respond. So um, now I'm de I, I debated for a while whether it would be better to reverse the order um, that you appear in the book in the interest of fairness, but um, uh, I, I well yeah, I, yeah let's do that let's do that so we, we can start with Ellen um, why do you think we need more democracy not less okay uh, well first of all thank you for for having me and Jason uh, and I want to thank Jason also for uh, you know uh, initiating this um, this uh, joint endeavor it's been it's been really actually interesting and I, I think we've had a debate for many years now it was a great opportunity to sort of zoom in on the on the real the real disagreements and I think uh, at least on my end I think I've made some progress on, on understanding exactly where we disagree and it turns out we do agree on on a few things including on the fact that um, the current system is not working uh, we disagree on the diagnostic obviously Jason thinks it's because it's too democratic and so we should try out more epistocratic solutions or uh, you know, schemes of plural voting or perhaps even exclusions altogether. And I think that, in fact, we need to, you know, try to solve the problems by making the system more democratic. So try more democracy as a, as a cure for the, the ears of um, the current system. And, the, you know, the, the basic argument hasn't changed in many years since I started making it. It's this idea that, um, Many minds are better and smarter than fewer minds, no matter how smart the fewer minds are. Um, so that the idea is that when you include everyone, you don't risk missing out on crucial arguments and information, crucial perspectives, uh, crucial values, crucial lived experiences, etc., crucial knowledge. And it's uh, true if the mechanism through which we produce decision is deliberation. So I'm not an aggregative Democrat. It's another um, difference between me and Jason, I believe. Um, he really focuses on, on the voter, right? And on the properties of preference and judgment aggregation. Uh, he's very skeptical of deliberation as a source of a, you know, um, uh, policies and laws. Uh, as of good policies and laws, he believes that you know this leads to polarization and all kinds of uh, systemic biases. And and I don't think that. I think that actually uh, we have ways of um, uh, there are models of how deliberation works that suggest that actually when it's structured properly and you have the relevant kind of cognitive diversity, it leads to better outcomes. Uh, different people with different models of the way the world works, information, knowledge, et cetera, can guide each other to the global optimum of a, of a given you know, um, epistemic landscape, so to speak. And, um, and of course, for deliberation to produce that, there are a number of conditions that need to be met. met. Um, it needs to be inclusive. It needs to respect the equality of participants. It needs to um, uh, you know, uh, start from an assumption of, of basic competence on the part of everyone. Um, so that there are, there are and, and everybody needs to be oriented toward the same goal, which is to figure out the truth. So there are a number of, of conditions, but 
in the model, which is of course simplistic in some ways because it's um, it's an idealization of of, uh, of reality, you get the the prediction that you will uh, converge toward the right answer. In you know whether the model applies to reality is, is always complicated because in reality you have all sorts of confounding factors and you have value disagreement, you have noise, you have uh, communication problems, you have uh, linguistic barriers, you have all kinds of things that, that make it so that um, actual democracies are a lot less uh, epistemically um, satisfying than, than the model would predict. But I still think that if we're looking for um, the mechanism that can account for the successes of actual democracies, I think we need to look to deliberation and aggregation allows us to settle disagreements when deliberation fails to, to, to um, end on a consensus. And it, it, it can substantially improve our chances of making the right predictions or making the right choices, but that's not the, the driving mechanism. So um, my view is that if we wanted to make existing democracies better, we should try to make it more deliberative and more inclusive. And it turns out that if we want to do that, I think a good way is through the use of randomly selected bodies, uh, so-called citizens assemblies. And so I go as far as saying, look, if, we, if we're serious about democracy, we should replace um, elected assemblies that are biased and skewed in terms of their uh, demographic makeup with lotocratic bodies, because there you have a chance of tapping the whole diversity of the group with respect to you know, the um, you know, multiplicity of problems that, that any group can encounter. And uh, I think we would, we would get a system that, that's a lot more um, epistemically uh, efficient, if you will. I do want to keep those, you know, but bodies connected to the rest of the populace. So it's not, a, a, you know, a, a defense of a, of a technocracy of mini publics, if you will, or a simulated public via um, citizens assemblies because I think that even those mini publics may miss out on some dimensions. And so they need to be constantly um, nourished by the input of the larger public and the larger public um, has a, a right to you know, be the final decision maker about the big ticket issues. But I do think that for normal politics, we could actually um, decide to constitutionalize and legitimize the legislative uh, role of such bodies. So that's what I call open democracy. And so it's an alternative that I think is epistemically superior to the current system. Great, thank you very much. Um, and open democracy, uh, Helen has a book on that as well, which you can look up if you're interested in that idea. Um, right, so Jason, why do you think we need less democracy? Yeah, well, once again, thank you for having me. Um, it's really delightful to be here today. And I'll start by saying that Oddly, Helen and I agree about this. Um, I also think that a lottery-based system and using mini publics and things like that would be epistemically superior. Um, I like Helen's work on that. Uh, Alex Guerrero at Rutgers has a book coming out on this. Um, I think there's quite a lot to be said for it. And so she's right. We both are skeptical of democracy as we find it. And the question is what we do about it. And I think it's also worth noting, neither one of us is doing what you might call ideal theory. We're not trying to say, what would a perfectly just polity look like? Like, I mean, my cards are on the table. I think if we were just, not even just perfectly just, but just decent, like morally decent people, we would be full-blown anarchist. I think, I think in a way government is sort of like the criminal justice system. It's at best a good response to depravity, but it's not itself something you would have in a good society. Um, so that's worth noting that because people often ask, well, are you, do you think the bestocracy is just? And I'm like, no, of course not. It's terrible. Uh, if only people were good, we wouldn't need it at all. So I think what I'm doing in this book is asking, what should we do given how people are, given what's wrong with people? And early on in the book, I try to introduce two basic models of voter behavior. The model that we all kind of learn early in school is that people have preferences about the way they want the world to be. They learn how government works and what government can do. They form an ideology on the basis of the information, the preferences they have. They vote for the party that matches those preferences. And voila, uh, we get a government that matches the political preferences of a large segment of the population, if not everybody. I don't think that's true. Um, and so good evidence would this be for people like Liliana Mason, Christopher Aiken, and Larry Bartels, the whole Michigan model that was started in like the 50s. Um, I think people aren't really using politics for policy. As Anthony Appiah says, they're voting for who they are, not what they want. 
And the reason for that is because their votes just don't matter very much. This is the central issue with aggregation. You spread out power so much that people use their votes as if they're basically worthless. So a good model for what people are up to, I think, when they're voting is uh, engaging in kind of expensive signaling. So if you think about the MS-13 gang in the United States uh, and some elsewhere too, like just around North America in general and the islands and so on, you know, people will commit crimes and wear horrible face tattoos. And this is a way of sort of proving their fidelity and their commitment to their group. And it works. It actually makes the group cohere better. Or if you think about how religion works, religions always ask you to engage in some degree of expensive signaling, either in the form of believing not readily apparent stuff or engaging in rituals that are very expensive for your time and your body and your life. And this sort of proves to other people you're one of them and you're loyal. Or think about sports fandom. I'm from the Boston area. So when I root for the Patriots and root for the Red Sox and the Celtics, it makes other people in my group like me as well. And the odd thing about these sort of behaviors is the stupider you are, the more it works, right? So if, if I just like say to my fellow Bostonians, like, oh, our team's great, whatever. I mean, you know, the Celtics won, they just uh, swept a series. That's just obvious. But if there's a call against our player and it's obviously correct, and I go, no, it's unfair, then my fellow Bostonians are like, he's really one of us. Look at how loyal he is. So I think what ends up happening when you have a signaling kind of behavior is that stupid ends up being the point. It works. The more radical and dumb you are, the more effective you are for the social benefits. And the people are largely using politics for social benefits. This explains why they're massively uninformed. They're very, they're not very ideological. Maybe 15 out of 100 Americans have something like a stable ideology or actually voting on the basis of policy preferences. So once you have this model, the question is, what do we do about it? I actually agree that I think even though I'm skeptical of deliberation, I think deliberation would fix would make things a lot better. Like if we did what Helene wanted to do, that would be better than what we're currently doing. I'm I'm completely willing to grant her that. Like she's right. Um, but uh, but but nevertheless, uh, given that we're probably going to have elections, we're going to do these things. What should we do about the stuff that we do end up voting on with regard to elections? I think there's a couple of things that follow from that. One is. Uh, we should maybe take more things off the table with regard to politics. Politics might not be good at certain things. And so maybe we, the question of like, should democracy decide is sometimes, well, maybe this should be left to civil society. Maybe it should be left to the market. In some cases, it means having a you know, greater division of power within government. You know, there's a reason why most governments have their central banks like kind of kept away from politics. And as we are seeing the United States and elsewhere right now, when these things get to be sort of controlled by politicians more and be swayed by politicians, bad things happen. Uh, it might mean that we, you know, we need to slow down decision making, you know, part of the point of the US Constitution was to reduce the speed of decision making to make, make people less stupid and less impassioned and, and now it's gone faster and that's sort of a problem. And it might mean in some cases, we should do things to try to correct the systematic errors that we see. So the, the things that I'm interested in, like I defend a sortition model at one point, another idea would be, what if we allow everyone to vote, including children, including your kids, including like your cat, like my dog who's barking in the background, let it vote too. Uh, but when we vote, we do three things. We say who we are, we take a quiz that shows what we know, and we say what it is we want. And if you do this in mass with you know, millions of people, you can statistically simulate what would the public have voted for had it been fully informed according to that quiz. And I, I want to use like a democratic mini public to choose what's on the quiz too. And then maybe do that instead of what we're actually doing. But I think the main thing here is that politics makes us mean and dumb and we are kind of stuck with that sort of person. So what do we do? And this is actually one reason why I'm a bit more skeptical of deliberation than Helen is. Um, I think if you put Helen and me in a room together and we were debating about this stuff, we'll, we will follow the Scott Page kind of model of good deliberation and good things will happen. But for a lot of people, when they walk into these rooms, they come with this ideological baggage that my point here is not really to solve the problem. My point is to say F you to the other people I disagree with. And this is often confounding uh, the results of democratic deliberation. As far as like the just one final bit, the why I think this is maybe obligatory, it's not just about I, I really think governance requires competence. If I'm going to exert power over other people, I owe it to them to act in good faith and to act competently. And I see this as a constraint which regardless of your background political philosophy, you should add this in as a requirement. Politics, power must be exercised competently and in good faith. So then the question is, how do we go about doing it? In a way, that's what uh, I, I think Helen really agrees with that. That's what we're basically debating is how do we get competent, good faith government? All right, okay, thanks very much to both of you. Um, so, um, 
first of all, I, I guess a few framing things. It, it, it seems like um, the, the, the thing that you're converging on is we're looking at ways to make the political process more epistemically robust. So this is a point about knowledge. Um, so for now, I guess, and, and in the book as well, I mean, you make this explicit, we're leaving aside questions of virtue or, you know, um, things that other, other people have raised about democracy. Um, I think Zhang Qing, the Chinese scholar, says the problem with democracy is that the people are just immoral, so we shouldn't do what they want anyway. Put that to one side. Um, and, and now, neither of us, neither of you are um, suggesting that um, there's anything particularly epistemically robust about the way we're doing things at the moment. So it's really just a question of, of uh, whether we would gain a more informed decision by opening it up to deliberation and uh, trying to maximize diversity, as Lynn suggests, or by trying to use techniques to cancel biases. Is that a, a fair characterization? Um, okay. Um, so uh, some of what you said, um, Jason, seemed to be uh, critiques of, of the current system in the sense that these issues about people using voting to signal and stuff like that, um, that, that they wouldn't necessarily apply to Helen's model, or, or would they? Well, that's a good question. Uh, if you could sort of start over in year zero and we hadn't had the kinds of systems that we had, if we had a different sorts of voting systems in the first place, even in the US, one of the reasons we're so polarized is that we use first past the post voting, which predicts that there will be two parties. And when you have two major parties, it makes it easier to engage in polarization of a really bad sort. And if we had um, you know, a proportional voting scheme like many European countries do, we wouldn't just be able to get away with that. Uh, and it would be less polarized. And I think deliberation would even work better because it, we wouldn't be walking in as enemies trying to sort of own and smite the other side. So I, I do think like maybe some of the things that are confounding the results of deliberation now when we try to do this outside of a laboratory and when you do with real people is they are coming in with this baggage where I see you as in the enemy camp. You know, I, I want to kind of make you look bad. I want, to, I want my side to win. And that's making deliberation not work as well as it could. If we could kind of start over with, if we only had ever had a deliberative model, if we didn't have political parties, if we didn't have a lot of the division that is giving rise to the identity politics, which is really kind of undermining democracy. I mean, the, the realist theory of democracy is that democratic behavior is about expressing identity and it's making it so we're not really using politics for what it's meant to be for. If we could somehow get rid of that, then I do think uh, deliberation work better. There are some questions about, you know, still issues of knowledge and whether you can get many publics well informed in enough time. So, uh, like Alex Guerrero, who I mentioned before, he's we got this book coming out defending autocracy, the use of lottery based systems and deliberation to make decisions. And he really wants to do things like select a thousand citizens and have them be in charge of uh, the transportation rules for the country for a year. But for that, he would even say something like, I don't expect in a weekend people are going to figure this kind of stuff out and be able to make smart regulations and smart rules. It's going to require that we sort of select them and pay them and have them make them somewhat expert about these things and give them real information. And of course, that confounds a lot of that. So um, it, a lot of it, I think, depends on what you're using deliberation for. Like, I don't, I don't think a body of 500 people would make good federal uh, monetary policy in a weekend. Um, whether they could vote on some other things, sure. There might be things that they actually would be quite good at. Um, okay, uh, Helen, would you like to respond to that? Well, yeah, so while we agree that, you know, this, the current system is very imperfect, I also want to say, though, that, you know, um, it's still better than the alternatives. In particular, you know, there's like a recent study by Asimo Glu et al. that shows that, you know, when you move from a non-democracy to a democratic regime, you actually increases your you, you increase your chances of having a you, you increase your GDP per, per capita by 20% over 30 years. That's not nothing. So yes, it's very flawed, and I think it's been increasingly flawed over the last 30 years for all kinds of reasons. Some of them having more to do with globalization and capitalism than democracy per se, but it's still better than the alternatives. So I just want to you know keep that in mind. So that's why 
well, I'm, I'm all for changing things. I also, I'm not a revolutionary. I don't necessarily want to um, scratch everything and, and start from zero because I'm, you know, we, we're still, <laughs> we're still, you know, um, in a better shape than, than countries that are non-democracies, I think. Okay, thanks. Um, on the uh, the central banking point, I, I just thought I would mention there there was a suggestion by somebody that you, since central banks mostly set the the base rate, um, somebody said, what if everybody could vote just in a kind of constant referendum on whether the base rate should go up by a point or down by a point? Uh, would that be so bad? Um, I think for, for, from what Elena was suggesting, it might not because different people have different ideas about what the interest rate means. I mean, it affects different people's situations, but um, you know, you might bring in ways of thinking about these kinds of questions that weren't within the expertise or the, the, the you know the kind of very limited way of looking at the problem that people central bankers have. Central bankers all go to the same sort of four or five universities and think in the same ways. So, to, can I get that one? Um, Please, yeah. Yeah, I think I'm I'm bothered by the way we're already framing this as like oh, it's always technical questions, monetary policy or or like a inflation rate or or interest rate or something like that. Well, there's there are always like you know value questions in the background. Um, who is that going to benefit? Who's going to pay the cost? What, how is that going going to affect the you know the cost of housing and and and, and for those questions, um, I think all of us have. Uh, an ability to have an opinion and a say and, 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 and should have a right about the kind of distributive justice you know, questions in the background of those more technical questions. And it's the same thing when, when I, so I studied um, closely the Convention for Climate in France, right? And what's really striking is that it, it, it was created in answer to the Yellow Vest movements, which itself was a social protest against a very technocratic approach to climate change, basically, the Macron government said, oh, it's about cutting greenhouse gas emissions. Easy, carbon tax. That's what all the experts, especially the economists, say. Let's do it. It failed. Why? Because it overly, you know, overwhelmingly punishes people who are um, lower class rural uh, workers who have to take their car every day and, and, and pay a lot, whereas it completely spares the wealthy urban people in the center of cities who bike or take the subway or something. So, so then the, the convention was convened precisely to solve a, a seemingly technical question by, by reinserting it in a social and, and political um, framework. Like, how do we do that, curb greenhouse gas emission, in a spirit of social justice? And, and you see that there, it's, it's kind of obvious that you have to include more voices, otherwise you're going to end up with social protests. Okay. Um, Jason, did, did you want to respond? I have a... Yeah, I'm, I should be clear. I'm not technocratic. In fact, I'm, I'm quite a bit less technocratic than a lot of people that call themselves pro-democrat. Like, I mean, Tom Cristiano is radically democratic and also really hardcore technocratic. And I'm, I'm anti-technocratic and, and not as strongly democratic. Part of the reason might be because I live in DC and the government are my neighbors and they're idiots. I like them. I have beers with them, but they're, they're just, they, they, they have no idea what the hell they're doing. Uh, so, so there's that. Um, I, I do think it's worth noting, though, that when we have these disagreements, it's not always because we're sometimes we are having just mere factual disagreements. Like we disagree about whether the minimum wage is going to have a disemployment effect or how severe it will be. Sometimes it is because we have genuine value differences. Um, and we maybe might talk later about sort of like the kind of Hong Page model and how it handles value disagreements when it comes to collective deliberation and what it might say about that. If we get into some of the nitty gritty of, of Hlen's argument in particular. Um, but I think oftentimes this is this is one of my worries about this is a, a lot of people who are expressing values don't really mean it. Like, let me say something that sounds false, but I think is actually very strongly supported by the evidence. The typical Democratic voter in the United States is not pro gun control. I'm sorry, they're not voting for the Democrats because they're pro gun control. They're saying they're pro gun, gun control because they vote for the Democrats. And you see elements of this all around where when you go around vote asking people, what are your values? What do you care about? What are your political goals? They'll, they don't like to say, I don't know. So they'll tell you something on the spot during an interview. You ask those same people the same question a few years later, or a couple of weeks later, a month later, they give you different answers. In fact, the early studies by Converse and others is what they were finding and getting evidence this year after year after year. Um, and you ask them, why do they change their mind? And they go, I didn't change my mind. I've always thought this. 
We saw this with um, the Trump voters in Republicans in the United States in 2016, before Trump was the presumptive nominee. Um, over, Republican voters overwhelmingly said that they were pro-free trade and they had all these value judgments that came with it. When a protectionist candidate became their presumptive nominee, they switched within about a month period to being anti-free trade and their values changed. You ask them, why did you change their mind? I didn't, I've always thought this. We saw this with Democratic voters with regard to war. Um, they were protesting the Iraq war under Bush. There wasn't that much policy change under Obama at first, but the protests dropped off. And it turned out they were really just antipathic to Bush. They weren't actually pro or really against the war. And the good work by that is by uh, Fabio Rojas called Party on the Streets. So I think a lot of the value stuff that people express isn't sincere. They, they I'm not saying they're lying. They believe it's sincere, but the, what they're actually doing is engaging in a pro-social signaling to prove to other people in their camp that they're one of them. And a good model for that would be think about people who go to church a lot, but who don't actually really believe that stuff, but they signal it and talk about it as if in order to kind of prove that they're a good member of that group, and then they get certain kinds of social benefits. So unless we can kind of break people free of this using politics for social purposes, using politics as an expression of identity to make friends with others, I, I just, I'm not, I don't think asking them about interest rates and stuff like that's really going to be helpful. Now, maybe if we could get, if we could just get rid of a lot of aggregative democracy and switch over to a hardcore deliberative model, maybe that would break the kind of party system that makes this work and it would be better. But for now, I, we got, I think we have to break the identity politics stuff first before we can really make the other stuff work. Or, may, or maybe a better way to put more uh, ecumenical way of putting it is maybe switching over would gradually wear that down and we'll see. You know, I mean, I, I mean, I hope Helen's right. You know, I, I hope we try and if it works. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you got to the at, at the end what I was about to ask you, which is, do you think all of these things would still apply in, in a more open um, form of, of democracy? Um, I feel like probably we should talk about this thing about value um, representation. So you, you brought up this um, Hong page theorem, which is, of course, a fairly technical point. Um, and, you know, and this is a public forum, but but I do think that um, one thing that Helen mentioned in the book was that her position wasn't based on that theorem as such. It was a kind of slightly um, uh, slightly different position. So I, I wonder, Helen, if, if you could um, articulate your point there, maybe using an, a, a real life example or something to kind of help people. Right, so first of all, there are multiple homepage theorems. So the one that I, um, I use mostly is the diversity trumps ability theorem. It's basically uh, a formalization of the idea that under certain conditions, you're better off so to solve problems with a group of average people who think differently than a group of experts or very smart people that score higher on a sort of a, you know, IQ continuum or something like that, or competence continuum but who think homogeneously or more homogeneously. And, uh, and of course, um, you know, it's, it's a form of results. So in a way, the, the conclusions follow from the premises. That's uh, what Jason objects to, that it's tautological in some ways. Um, not denying that, it's a theorem. That's what theorems do. But I do think that contrary to what he says, uh, it's not intuitive at all. I think uh, the conclusions you get run against an entrenched belief that experts know best even when they're homogeneous, that average shows, you know, I don't, I think basically what this um, theorem um, sort of uh, unveiled for me is the possibility that when it comes to collective intelligence, we should stop thinking of it in terms of, a, of a, an addition of individual intelligences. You know, it's really more about the group property. Does it contain enough diversity that, that you know, we're going to push each other um, closer again to this global optimum. And, and that I think is actually, uh, it's not trivial at all. Um, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, for me, it was a paradigm shift. It's like, oh, I'm looking now at democracy, not as like a sum of individual voters. I, th I think Jason still does, but like as really, oh, it's an, it's an interaction and I need to focus on the group properties perhaps more than on the individual properties. So, that's what it does. And in fact, it's the same thing for another theorem, uh, the, the condensate jury theorem. You could say, oh, totally trivial. Of course, if you assume that uh, everyone has a 0.51 probability of getting it right at infinity, you know, when the group is large enough, uh, the majority is right with a probability of one. Trivial. No, it's not trivial. It's amazing. It's, 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 there's something quite 
uh, to me, miraculous and, and magical about the fact that you go from someone who's, you know, could totally get it wrong, you know, barely better than currently, to a group that where well, the majority can get it right. I mean, it's, you know, so anyway, so I think those, those terms are not at all trivial. They're only trivial because we look at them now, they're very established, and so, and you can reverse engineer the logic, and so you can trace the results to the premises. That doesn't mean the, 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 the initial process of going from the premises to the conclusion was not a, a find or a, <clears throat> an amazing result. Anyway, maybe I'm more uh, easily imp impressionable than, than Jason is, but for me, these, these results are, are remarkable. And, and in fact, it's interesting to see that uh, other theorems like the you know, RO impossibility theorem, which leads to very negative conclusions about democracy, that one, oh my God, brilliant, you know, Nobel Prize worth, I mean, so it's always in one direction that things are not surprising and and, um, and trivial. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, so so um, sorry, I forgot the the question in the process of defending. Well, could, could you actually uh, could you just very oh, quickly, example, I mean, yeah. diversity trumps ability might be yes, tricky, so, but could, could you give a very quick rundown of what the Condorcet theorem is so and then what? My, the, my go to sort of example is actually fictional because I, I think it's really it's really neat and. Uh, it's uh, this movie 12 Angry Men where you have very different protagonists. You have uh, you know, an old person, you have a, uh, a person who grew up in the slums, you have a lawyer, uh, an architect, uh, you have a stockbroker, stock you have all these different profiles. And they're supposed to decide whether a young Puerto Rican kid accused of murdering his father is guilty or not guilty. And the movie is always portrayed as this um, illustration of like the power of dissent and, and because juror number eight, which is who is played by um, Henry Fonda, you know, goes against the majority and decision initially to, to judge guilty. He says, no, let's talk, let's deliberate. So they have a deliberation process, which is the whole movie. And really, I think it really neatly illustrates how you go from quasi certainty that the kid is guilty to certain, I mean, certain unanimity, unanimous judgment that he most likely isn't, or at least there's reasonable doubt through a, a reassessment of the evidence, um, a different way of looking at the testimonies of the witness in particular. Um, and, and, and so for example, the one damning thing was the fact that they found the weapon of the murder, it's a switchblade. And they think, oh, very clearly murdered because the, the, the visual witness um, described how the person was, was uh, stabbed. Turns out the kid from the um, bad neighborhoods knows how to use a switchblade and he says you would never kill someone using it that way. So there's a sort of uh, experiential knowledge that, that comes to discussion and changes the track on which it is and, and, and makes the group slowly go away from the judgment of, of guilt to a judgment of non-guilt. And, and, um, and, and it's really important to see that none of the, even the smart jurors, you know, Jason in the book says, well, you know, the, the, the assumptions of the theorem are, are way too um, um, biased because you assume there's only one perspective per, per player, when in fact, smart people have like multiple uh, talents and can bring multiple perspectives whereas, whereas stupid people or average people can only bring one. Yeah, but even the very smart juror, which is your, um, who is juror number eight in the scenario, by himself, there's only so much he can go, only so far he can go in the deductive uh, process. And it's sometimes it just takes one person, one person who doesn't contribute much, but they contribute the one idea that will move the discussion along. And, and so that's what I'm saying when I say, look, we can't afford to lose even one voice because that might be the crucial voice and we don't know where it's gonna come from at any point. And sure, we would save time and money if we just got rid of a bunch of people we think don't contribute much, but why would we do that? Democracy should cost, should cost something and we can't afford to include everyone. And, and if they don't contribute, then deliberation will filter out what they don't have to say or the bad things they have to say. So I just, I just don't understand the urge to exclude anyone when I only see, um, you know, the, the epistemic potential of, of inclusion. Um, yeah, no, that's that's very that's very nicely put. So I think, and that that's a nice point that we can focus on is the risk of losing even one voice is is actually much higher than you might think because that one voice might be the. The one that, and the cost that of inclusion is, is not that high. That's, that's and the your... cost of inclusion is not high. Right. Good. Okay. Um, I think I, th I mean, there are loads of great questions coming in from the Q&A, better than I could have thought of, which is kind of demonstrating your point. But um, 
Uh, I, I thought maybe Jason could have a chance to reply to some of that, and then we'll go to, to questions from the audience. Yeah, I think this actually, I think, illustrates some of the differences in our methodological approaches, because I would, that's a great movie. Um, I've shown it in philosophy classes before, but I would, I would instead look at how well do juries actually perform? Like, what's the empirics on them? When Helen's right that every formal theorem has a bunch of premises which deductively lead to a conclusion. So when I said that I'm worried about it being trivial, I don't, I don't worry about that. Um, I think the difference is that the assumptions are very close to the thing meant to be proven. Um, and so with Page and Hong and Page, like their assumptions are things like we're talking about a problem that's really hard that no one can solve on their own. Imagine every problem solver um, is fairly sophisticated and they have a method that's effective, but they get stuck on something. And then the diversity assumption is imagine that whenever you get stuck, there's someone else in the audience in the, in the group that you're deliberating with who has something that can improve upon your current existence or your current, your current kind of solution. Um, and also we're all working together where we're willing to defer to one another. We are, we, we, we have like similar value judgments. So like what we count as good and bad are the same. Then under those conditions, it follows kind of trivially, I think that like, well, if you're going to, more diversity will improve things because it's almost stipulated. In fact, the diversity either has no effect or it improves it. And this is, a, I think a difference between Page and Helen. Page is actually super modest about this stuff. Like, let me, let me give you a quote out of his book. I, I, li I literally just reread uh, the whole thing yesterday, not for this, but for something else. He says, the benefits of diversity exist. They're not huge. I think that's on 331. Yeah, because he then reviews like the empirics and he's like, for him, he's like, it requires, what he's basically saying is if, if you get like a problem, like uh, our company has a PR problem, given what's happened with a toxic spill, how do we deal with this? And we all agree that it's important to solve this problem. And you're an engineer and you're a marketing person and you're a janitor and you're uh, a person with management background and whatever. We have these different skill sets and heuristics that we use to solve the problem. And we're actively thinking and deferring to one another's greater expertise and listening in a careful way. Then that kind of cognitive diversity, and notice it's cognitive diversity. He's actually very clear. It's not identity diversity, it's unless identity diversity happens to track cognitive diversity, which sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. That kind of cognitive diversity can improve deliberation, but you know how often is that actually happening in the real world? Because we don't have these assumptions appearing in a deliberation. We disagree a great deal on values. Um, we are not trying to solve the problem when we're talking to one another. One of us is smart enough to solve the problem. Um, we have multiple methods, or we don't defer to one another's greater expertise, or there isn't actually someone else in the crowd it's not clear that it's going to make things better. And he, he himself early on in the book does like kind of contradicts Helen quite a bit. And he says, I'm not saying it's always going to be best to have as many people possible. He's like, oftentimes you just want a body of experts solving problem. He says something like, when it comes to brain surgery, we don't ask the public, we ask the brain surgeons. So he has a pretty limited view and very modest view of what diversity can do. He thinks the empirical evidence supports that modest view. I think that's probably right. Um, I think Helen is much more excited about what this stuff means than he is. And that doesn't mean she's wrong. Sometimes people have a theorem and it implies way more than they themselves accept. You know, I've, I had, I've run that same thing. I think Skull Althaus's work is much more radical than he thinks it is, right? So that happens. But I think that's where the difference is. Um, so I'm, I'm worried that the premises of the proof are very close to the conclusion, not simply that they imply it. Can I, can I reply to that? Um, so the thing, the reason why I, I'm more excited than um, uh, Scott Page is because I derive a different theorem from his. So that's why the, the, the support for the you know democratic superiority um, that, that that's where it come it comes from. So I said, look, what I really like about the the home page uh, result is that it tells us something about the mechanism that. Um, you know, makes deliberation produce good outcomes. And I think it's, it's about indeed bringing different perspectives on, on an issue. And all, all I'm saying is that, well, uh, a proxy for diversity uh, in the political context specifically will be numbers. And um, the, the reason why this is um, specific to the political context as opposed to the business context or the brain surgery context is because politics is about a sort of fuzzy domain where you really can't predict ahead of time what the 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 skills and and relevant knowledge will be for brain surgery you know yeah sure so you you don't want a diversity of profiles you mostly want surgeons maybe trained differently on on maybe monetary policy same thing you want some austrian economists and, and some keynesian ones because that's a relevant diversity for that purpose but for politics it's um it's actually the realm where there's no 
it's the it's the first um, you know uh, uh, line between us and the world. That's where we start addressing the, the 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 threats that the world throws at us in a collective way. So it could be anything. It could be an earthquake. It could be a, an economic crisis. It could be a climate change. It could be a inflation. It could be so. That's where I think that um, the implications are, are much more inclusive than in the case of like brain surgery or, or monetary policy even. It's because there are so many things we need to know. So why again would we ahead of time say, oh, well, let's exclude all the, you know, um, housewives because they don't read enough or let's exclude, uh, you know, people who can't take a test and... I, I don't know, maybe the, the, the issue will be about, you know, uh, frontline workers, child care, and why is that knowledge not relevant? So I think Jason is totally right. We have a, a profound methodological, um, it's not a disagreement, I would say, but I think it's more, of, these are different cognitive styles. I tend to think that formal theorems have, a, have an elegance and a simplicity to them that, that allow you to really nail the, the mechanism and, and have a clean approach to a problem. He prefers relying on empirical evidence. That said, I have engaged in empirical work and I've tried to gather my own empirical evidence, you know, in the context of the Icelandic um, process, for example, or the French process. So I'm, I'm all for empirical evidence. I just don't get the clean answers I need, you know, because there, there, it's correlation, not causation, it's a bunch of confounding factors, you're never sure, it's very murky. Whereas with, with models, you get really a neat story. It could be wrong, but at least it's neat and clear and, and, and kind of like, leads to conjecture that can then be falsified empirically. Um, but what we disagree also is not just the methods. So, so I think our understanding of what political knowledge mean. Um, and I, I think, I mean, I'm not sure Jason, feel free to, to disagree, but you have an understanding of it as much more factual and causal. I think you, you want people to know who their senator is uh, what the effect of minimal wage on inflation is. You, you want them to draw those connections. And so that's why it's kind of easy to, for you to think that, oh, we just have to come up with the test, right? And take, people take the test and then we know if they're politically competent or not. And I'm a lot more agnostic. I don't know what political real knowledge really is. I just know that it's gonna have so many dimensions that I wouldn't, I, I think it's hubristic to think you can put it in a book, in a booklet or a, or a test. I, I, I'm much closer to the view of somebody like, um, uh, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois, who had this like really all-encompassing vision of, of political knowledge as having, of course, factual, scientific, but also um, experiential, practical, potentially emotional and, and aesthetic um, dimensions as well. And, and there, how, what are you going to put to the test, you know, on the test? You're going to have to ask questions about... Uh, justice, um, you know, things that are, that don't have a right or wrong answer. And, and it's very hard to test people on that. Okay, thanks. Um, I feel like we should move to some of the, the questions from, I mean, you know, you feel free to keep coming back to these points, but um, so I, I have uh, questions for Helen, questions for Jason, and then questions for both. So I'll, I'll start with a question for Jason. This is um, somebody wondering whether one side of politics is more inclined towards team-based thinking than the other, and if so, why that might be. Um, yeah, great question. Uh, no, I don't think so. I think um, it, libertarians are more analytic than others. That's that. There we go. Uh, no, everyone's team oriented. Uh, what's actually kind of surprising about this pretty robust literature on this is that it's been mostly been done by moderate Democrats, people who are in the Democratic Party. And it often comes up that the Democrats are a little bit worse. You know, when we test like motivated reasoning and things like that, they're usually a little bit worse. Not enough to make a really big difference, not enough for Republicans to get excited. It's like we both got Fs and you got we got a slightly lower F than they did. Uh, that I think the team-based mentality is prevalent on both sides. I think it's, I think if anything, it's a little bit less prevalent in kind of extreme or uh, unusual views because there's a, a extreme in the sense of like Marxism or kind of views where there, there isn't any real power because you're getting a selection effect, not, not a quality of the view itself. You're getting a selection effect where you're getting more genuine intellectuals that are just drawn to that because they think it's interesting and they like ideas, but it's still not enough to make even those things anything worth bragging about. Uh, 
overwhelmingly politics is about identity expression and kind of proving to other people that I'm the right, I'm one of them. I'm, I'm an artist and artists vote green. So I'm going to parrot whatever the green party says and the stupider is the louder I'll parrot it and the more it'll reward me. Um, everyone's doing it. They're doing about equally nothing. The differences don't really matter. Thanks. Um, okay, one for Helen. Um, uh, somebody, this is Tony Salgado Borja asking, I was wondering how under your proposal we can accommodate the fact that sometimes diversity overrepresents specific groups and hence can be subject to the objection that it's undemocratic. Okay, so diversity. Uh, first of all, I, I want to say that I agree with Jason, diversity, cognitive diversity is not the same as gender diversity, racial diversity, um, religious diversity and all that. I mean, it's distinct from both its causes and some of these causes, the causes of the, the different way we, we process things are can be our gender, can be our particular history, our, our, our geographic location. But cognitive diversity is not the same. And it's not the same either as some of the outcomes of, of cognitive diversity, such as uh, value diversity, um, uh, opinion diversity, et cetera. So I agree with that. That said, sometimes you, you have to use either of these you know, causes or, or outcomes as a, as a proxy for cognitive diversity because you just can't cut open people's brain to look or, or figure out, or you, we don't have access to what cognitive diversity looks like. So we tend to infer it based on proxies that are very imperfect. And, and there's always a danger of essentializing people. You think, oh, you know, uh, white vegetarian are going to think this. And, and then this is kind of unfair to the lone, you know, white vegetarian who doesn't think that. But um, so do we sometimes over uh, sample certain types of diversity? Probably, but um, you know, there's not just epistemic considerations in a democracy or in any kind of political um, community. You, you also have uh, uh, historic uh, considerations, historic reparations. Uh, you, you have, uh, uh, you know, justice considerations. And so it could be that oversampling certain groups actually harm the epistemic quality of deliberation or outcomes. It's, it's you know, it's something that you have to, to weigh. It might be worth it. Um, uh, in fact, du, du Bois himself said, look, I know if we include women, it's going to dumb down the quality of, of our deliberations. And so what? We, we have to do it and, and, uh, and, and the benefits are going to be more long term as they educate themselves and, and learn. It was, not, it was not politically correct that way. Um, so yes, there are different types of diversity and, and they, they are not always bringing um, an, an increase in epistemic performance. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah, I wonder if I could add something to that. Um, this is something I've been thinking about too, with regard to you know, because we have a worry with democracy of overrepresentation of certain groups. I mean, a, a simple model would be: imagine ninety percent of the public is white and ten percent is black. They think of themselves that way. All the white people are incredibly prejudiced against black people, and we have equal voting. What we'd expect is oppression facilitated through democracy. So, one thing you know, I, I mentioned before these statistical techniques, uh, like, you know, calculating what an enlightened public might want. Another thing you can do, and political scientists do this, is to sort of see how racial or other um, categories affect our voting behavior. And you can't do that for any individual, we don't know, but on mass, you can, and mass, you can do that. So you can do things like have everyone vote when they vote, tell you who they are, what they know, and what they want. And then you can see statistically, what would happen if I waved a magic wand and made it so everyone had no race? What if I waved a magic wand and made the entire population this race rather than that, that race? There's still a flaw in this because the way you categorize things will show up in your statistics. You know, in the US, we call Asian a bunch of people who are very highly unrelated, have very different cultures. It's a stupid category. And all categories are going to be stupid in this way, some more than others. But you can at least in principle, check for these things statistically. And that doesn't mean maybe we should vote this way and actually use it, but it might be something that a good democratic system would use to check to see if there is this kind of bias. And then once we are informed that there is, we can try to ameliorate it in various ways. Right, okay, thanks to you both. I thought I would just mention quickly, um, the last I read out of 100 congressional seats in the US, 50 of them are occupied by millionaires. I was just thinking, if you were taking a random sample, the sample would have to get huge before you hit even one millionaire. So it's, um, not, neither here nor there. But uh, another question, which I think is directed to both of you, um, 
It seems that the Russian invasion of Ukraine has led to a groundswell of support for democracy, um, at least here in the UK it has. Has, has the U invasion led either of you to change or modify your positions in any notable ways? Or has it made you more or less optimistic about democracy? I would say, I've been mean, talking to my friend Eric Winsberg about this, like it's amazing to see the anti-war Democrats from 2008 and how so many of them are pugilistic and hawkish and like we should go to actual war with russia tomorrow and it's like that's it for me it's like well that's a nice illustration of the thing i was talking about with regard to insincerity of policy preferences uh back in 2016 people were asking me about russia and all these other alternatives and I, I this is stupid but i'll just say my view of democracy is kind of like my view of iron maiden i'm a fan of the band iron maiden i think a lot of their albums from the 90s are terrible i think they agree uh and so we have to you know do what's good with iron maiden but they're not the best band in the world and there could be a better band um, but they're pretty great. And so I think one of the things that worries me is that when people see the flaws of democracy, they don't react by doing what we're doing in this room right now, virtually, but it's like, how can we make it better? They react by turning towards strongman authoritarianism and populism, which involves maybe a strong woman in France. We almost had that, you know, it could, didn't work out, good thing. Uh, and that's really worrisome. Um, so I think democratic backsliding is really quite bad. And uh, I'll just be on the table saying I, that's not what I have in mind. Uh, so how does yeah the, the Russian invasion change my view or not? I it just makes me also more worried about the flaws of the current system. So I was trying to defend it, you know, a little bit before by saying, look, uh, supposedly the GDP you know increases when you have a when you move to democracy, but if you move to a democracy that's so flawed and and a lot of you know developing countries believe that moving to a system of electoral democracy would change everything. And it changed nothing. It was just a different cast of uh, exploiters and kleptocrats with the <clears throat> veneer of legitimacy that uh, elections grant. So, and, what, and, and even in advanced, so-called advanced democracies like France, uh, the UK, the US, you see that the flaws are such that they, they really push, as Jason said, they push voters in the arms of um, people like Trump and authoritarians, and, and that's very scary. Mine, Marine Le Pen reached 40%. When I, when I was young, like 10%, and we were up in arms, we thought, I never thought this, this would happen. Um, so does it change my view? Yeah, well, it makes me feel like that we need to fix things even more quickly than I thought we, we, we should. And at the same time, it makes me very skeptical that this open democracy model that I'm, I'm calling for has any chance of, of um, getting off the ground. That it's just, it's very uh, mixed, um, very, very mixed feeling. Thanks. Okay, well, um, that kind of brings me to the last question I think we'll have time to ask, which is, um, should democracy be structured in such a way such that the likes of Le Pen could never come to power? Um, I guess I can put that to both of you. This is directed to Hélène, but um well we, we 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 started initially 20 years ago by saying look the likes of le pen should never be on tv we should never talk to them we should never dignify them with you know uh uh access to and i think it made things worse so um as long as she's within the, the you know acceptable boundaries of, of democratic norms and she still is, no matter how distasteful her, her views are, I think we should include her, of course. I, I don't think the solution is to censor and, and not have hard discussions. I think the solution is more deliberation. And I think actually she's still lost. So we had a debate and she didn't make a good, good enough case. Um, we can talk about whether Macron was that great, but you know he was very technocratic and, and, and arrogant in some ways and, and you know won on, on technicalities in some cases, but but she lost fair and square. So yes, we took a risk, but you know, we still, I, I don't think right now we should, you know, uh, ban or censor or uh, resort to non-democratic and in fact, illiberal solutions. Yeah, Jason, yeah I'd agree. Yeah. And Sorry, yeah. I'd say like the, what, the funny thing that happened in the United States in 2016 was despite writing a book called Against Democracy, when Trump became president, it turned out I was like more, I was had more faith in democracy than many of my pro-democratic colleagues because they were making these proclamations. It's the end, it's over. We're going to be a fascist country. World War III is going to start. We'll never have another real election, et cetera, et cetera. And despite a few bumps in the road that led to it being unpleasant to visit downtown for about a year, um, 
we overcame it, right? Not that Biden's great. I mean, if someone's like, do you think like we should have a system in which Le Pen can never be president? I don't think anyone who's ever been president of any country has ever deserved to be president of any country. I don't, none of them are good enough for me. But, uh, but no, I don't think, democracies have a pretty good track record of surviving these things and overcoming them and having the future contest is a way of solving the problem. If you can just have another contest, they really suck. They have a tendency to get rid of them. What's worrisome is when you have someone come in like Erewhon, who then manages to get a constitution changed to like further entrench their power to make the system less democratic than it otherwise is. Um, but censorship and things like that. But, I mean, the problem with these tools is that they are always going to be captured by people who want to use them for illicit and bad ends. If you gave me the power to censor other people, being perfectly virtuous, I would only do wonderful things with it. But the problem is that kind of power will be captured by less virtuous people who want to use it for selfish and corrupt reasons. And historically speaking, they're very good at getting that power. So we don't create a KGB. But in grad school, I remember a student saying, if this goal of environmental justice is so important that if we need a KGB to do it, so be it. Let's just make sure the right people run the KGB. There's no such thing as the right people running the KGB.